So I'm going to introduce to you uh, our guest speaker. He was here yesterday and spoke in depth. Uh, and it was very, very interesting, uh, the points that he had to say. A uh, former U.S. professor, author, uh, he's got books on sale. I, I believe you only got a few left, haven't you? Because they, they went like hot cakes yesterday. I think there's a few left over there. Uh, board member of the American Freedom Party and former Croatian diplomat, it's Dr. Tom Sunik. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me well? Yeah. All right. Well, first and foremost, again, thank you very much for, for being here, and I'm very happy and I'm very grateful also to Mr. Nick Griffin for inviting me here. I'm going to talk, if you don't mind, for about a half an hour, possibly a little bit longer, and if you don't mind, uh, you may ask me afterwards a few questions, or two or three questions about the specific topic that I tend to, uh, that, uh, to address. I'm going, I'm going to talk about... Uh, uh, new forms of uh, repression, both intellectual and physical repression in the so-called glorious West, which I call, which I name the system. And I will try to make some parallels and draw some parallels rather with the former communist Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, the communist Yugoslavia. I was born in communist Yugoslavia before I became a, a U.S. Uh, uh, citizen. And I, of course, I would like to, to project a little bit of my talk into the UK, UK uh, reality or virtual reality, we can also, also put it that way. Before I start, let me again just do this uh, usual stuff. I would like to extend my best greetings from my friends from the American Freedom Party. I'm a board member. It's a small party, and I would certainly encourage some of you, especially the younger audience, to get in touch with some of my friends. We have some very powerful professors sitting on our board. We still enjoy the First Amendment, so we can still say certain things in the United States of America, which for some reasons are not allowed to be mentioned and said in continental Europe. I'll come to that in a second. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm a pretty prolific author. You can gauge and you can judge my prose yourself. I have published books in uh, the French language and uh, the English language. And uh, please do feel free to contact me, and especially I'm addressing this to you. I like working with students, folks, so feel free to write to me, tom.sunik at uh, gmail.com, and I'd be very happy to assist you either with some whatever, if you are guys interested in French literature, or for that matter, the German literature, I'd be happy to be of some assistance. You know, I've spent my whole life reading. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay very well, but, you know, I like it. You know? So everybody has his own bliss, so to say. And, yes, my, my website is www.tomsunic.com. And please do feel free, if you have some friends, some good patriots, some people of character. That's something also the issue we need to address, not just the issue of race, but also the issue of character. I'm sure, folks, that I'm just digressing a little bit. That unfortunately, I've met many, many nationalists in Germany. I'm frequently a guest there in France, in Canada, in Quebec as well. And then uh, in Australia, I was recently, and uh, I've met wonderful people, good, you know, how can I say, heavy-duty nationalists, but sometimes I do have problems with their character. I'm not going to mention their names. You can be, you can yourself judge who is truly your friend and who is your foe, but do be careful with those big-time nationalists who sometimes like posturing with those big words about race and what have you, big white biceps and what have you. But back behind, they have a, a lizard brain, you know, not not very intelligent folks to start with, not very uh, people of character. Again, I also would like to to send my greetings from our party chairman William Johnson, who is a prominent lawyer who is our chairman of the American Freedom Party in L.A. He's a very good guy, good connections. He's a Mormon, but he's, he's a very nice gentleman in terms of his character. But I certainly would encourage you, if you ever travel to the United States, to get in touch with me or with our party members. Now, talking about, you know, my, my, the title, title may sound a little bit esoteric for the double me to, to double talk to double me. You know what double talk means. It's, I hate using this word Orwell. I affect, in fact, I, I will go as, as far as, as, as arguing that uh, if Orwell was alive, he would be shocked because we are well past the Orwellian time. We, we, we live really in dark times, you know. He was probably not even aware of many compound names and nouns in the English language which popped up recently. I call it as a, uh, the language, the lingo of the thought police that has spread out from, 
from uh, literally from Alaska to Alabama, from, uh, from Alabama all the way to Sweden and all the way to Greece as of recently. So yes, I'm going to look at some first at some uh, linguistic, uh, uh, some li uh, some linguistic, some verbal uh, traps, so to speak, uh, with this intellectual repression. Now I would encourage you. You don't have to be big time academics, folks, but do read the newspapers, do read the Guardian, do read the Independent, do, do read the New York Times. You don't have to necessarily read the, your press and your media. I always want to find out what my enemy, what my detractors, how they perceive me, how they, what would I, how do I figure in their mind. Mindset. I read the frequently on the daily basis the Haaretz and the Jerusalem Post because I'm not just interested in the substance of what they're saying, I'm also interested in the structure of their sentences. And this is something you've got to look at, especially if you read The Independent or The Guardian. By the by, I was published in The Independent and The Guardian about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was then I was a diplomat. I was published in The New York Times. I was also published in The Jerusalem Post, believe it or not. They had a very hardcore piece of mind against communism, ex-communist Yugoslavia. <clears throat> so, again, I'm aware of the fact that most of us are sort of being uh, swamped by this... Uh, by those adjectives and by those nouns, Nazis, white supremacists, racist. Uh, I also, my name, you can find it on SPLC and ADL list, you know, but they, they don't really defame me. They just state the obvious thing that I'm a professor, doctor in pro pro political science and comparative ling linguistics. But yes, of course, we can call those agencies like ADL, SPLC, like spying agencies. They're pretty much interested in what's going on in quote unquote racist and right wing circles. Now, I myself, I'll tell you, I'm possibly a little bit better, uh, how can I put it? I, I'm, I'm a little bit advantaged his, from the historical perspective. I have a, a certain privilege, w w w specifically my privileges of being born in ex-communist Yugoslavia, you know. So this word like fascism, Nazism, was just a common menu of the communist apparatchiks in communist Yugoslavia. Those of you who are to some extent familiar with communist Czechoslovakia or Romania, or those of you who are fluent in the Russian language, if you read some late, la, la, some uh, old issues of the Pravda magazine, not today's Pravda, Pravda is now good <laughs> online, but let's say the Pravda uh, hard, uh, hard issue, the, uh, the hard um, issue of the Pravda, let's say in the 60s and 70s, there were certain words, certain repetitive words which, uh, you know, even an, a layman could detect that they were just a blatant mendacity, blatant lie. Like, I can just give you a really rough example. In the Yugoslav communist press, when I was a high school boy, I would frequently encounter this type of a structure. Counter-revolutionary clerical elements, I'm just making it up, with... Uh, with the full approval of counter-revolutionary circles from Washington and the decadent West are uh, con constantly uh, uh, trying to undermine our mother socialist Yugoslavia and to disintegrate it in order to promote some clero-fascist new uh, regime. This was the type of a, a sentence, this was the type of a, a sentence structure that was used quite often, almost on all wavelengths, by former communist press in former communist Europe until 1990, before the wall came down. Again, if you study, if you know some friends in, who are in uh, uh, comparative linguistics from different universities, or you can yourself, you can look at it. It's really not such a big intellectual effort. But what, what's very typical that this word fascism and racism was quite often appearing and coming in, a, in a, was, was quite often a, uh, it was quite a salient word in the communist prose. So when somebody tells me now this, well, tell me you're a fascist and well, you're, you're a racist, uh, don't, don't make disclaimers. Here's my word of advice. Don't say, no, I'm not a racist. No, I'm not an anti-Semite. Because this actually makes it, this is just exactly what your enemy, what your, what your interlocutor wants to hear from you. Just ask him a, a, a rhetorical question. Sir, what do you mean by anti-Semite? What do you mean by racist? What do you mean by fascist? Can you give me a clear-cut definition of it? So never ever say, no, I'm not. don't be on the defensive side, because it won't help you at all. You know, even right now, at this moment, I'm not a fascist, I'm not a Nazi. But, of course, I'm being cataloged, I'm being sort of conflated in this category of a, 
wild Nazi beast, you know, Nazi fascist, and the whole, you have this whole imagery in the media that these Nazis, the neo-Nazis, whatever they call us, or the, be it the Golden Dawn, or be it the NPD, I know those people very well, or the Front National in France, or for that matter, the American Freedom Party, we have frequently portrayed as some crazy beast or some or some amoebas or cannibals or or to say or to say the least as some toothless hicks you know some people who are primitive who never read stuff who are just completely illiterate who are just crazy first they make fun of us secondly when we become a little bit dangerous they try to ostracize us we don't have access to the big media and the third thing well the third thing when push comes to shove then they use some very very sophisticated means of repression like they do in Germany and like they do in Austria. I'll tell you quite frankly, I'm frequently a guest in Germany of uh, NPD and different associated parties, but I'm extremely careful how I frame my words and how I frame my syntax, okay? Because I want to make sure that things are not being extrapolated out of my, out of my uh, speeches, out of my talks. I hope I don't sound too academic. I just want to let you know, again, this is the first point I want to make. Words like fascism, Nazism, racism are absolutely meaningless today, okay? My dad, my dad was a former lawyer, in a Catholic lawyer in communist Yugoslavia. He was adopted by the Amnesty International here in 84 when he was serving his prison sentence, four-year prison <laughs> sentence in communist Yugoslavia. So I had to travel to London. This was back then, in the, during the Cold War, when, when you could say that you're an anti-communist and you could still elicit some sympathy even among some... Thatcherite Christ, uh, circles or Reagan circles or whatever. I knew some of those people. I even knew some folks. Uh, Robin Harris, probably the name sounds too familiar, was Margaret Thatcher's advisor. So we had pretty good ties uh, at some point. This was back then during the Cold War when anti-communism was still to some extent acceptable, when we were not all of us, you know, just portrayed as Nazis or Nazi beasts or racists. Now things have dramatically changed for the worse. And again, this always brings back the memory of the communist pros in communist Yugoslavia. And once again, a second, a second conclusion of mine, uh, young, uh, young gentlemen, sirs, uh, young, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and especially I'm addressing this for your students. Like, uh, again, keep in mind when they call you racist or racialist, whatever Nazis, just ask them, what do you mean by that? For instance, okay, I'm digressing a little bit, but, but that, I mean, I would probably need a whole semester to discuss about this. Stalin called Trotsky, you know, Trotsky was his uh, counterpart. He also called him a, a fascist, okay? So this was a standard uh, lingo, a standard nomen used by the communists, first among themselves, and then later on, prior to the Second World War, it was used uh, in, in, in Stalin's purges for all those who, for some reasons, were deviating from the party politics, were called fascists within the, within the Soviet, within the early Soviet Union. After the Second World War, this word fascism gained momentum and became very well entrenched, particularly in academia, here at the Yo University or Cambridge University, Oxford University, let alone the Berkeley University, University of California, where I studied. I was literally surrounded by leftists, you know, Mimickers, if I can put it that well, what do you call them? People who just uh, mimicked this uh, uh, leftist type of a lingo like uh, um, diversity, ethnic sensitivity training, multiculturalism. All those words are relatively new and don't fall into the trap of that. Okay, just if somebody keeps telling you, well, um, we are in favor of multiculturalism, as I said yesterday, just ask the, the person a provocative question, sir or professor. Can you please explain it? Play dumb sometimes. Can you explain me what you mean by multiculturalism, okay? Just ask them a, a question from the etymological perspective. Can you give me the root of this? Can, what is the meaning? How do you define it yourself, okay? So again, <clears throat> uh, the second conclusion I want to make. There was a big advantage of living in communism. Yes, I'll tell you. And you know what, what was the advantage? Now I can see it, you know, 30 years or 40 years after. <clears throat> All of us, all of our kids, I was a city boy, you know, from Zagreb, so we didn't know very much about Noam Chomsky or for that matter, all this big stuff, big, big this literature and all this uh, philosophical books, Carl Schmidt, you name it, Carlyle, Nietzsche and what have you. But we were smart guys, street kids, and we could tell very distinctly the main political issue, and that was who was my friend and who was my foe. 
Okay, this is the basics of, of basic of politics. You know, if somebody asks you how you define politics, the distinction between friend and foe, and why could I define my foe? Because he was visible, he was gross, he was vulgar, he was using such a mendacious talk that nobody even believed. Even even the party hacks didn't believe in what they were talking about. Even they did not believe in this glorious communist future, in this end time, you know, in this brotherhood and unity, in this promiscuous Yugoslav or Soviet society with people who would chat with each other forever and ever in a beautiful, in a progressive society. It never worked. We knew that this was a lie. And that's why the system collapsed. It did not collapse from without. It, not the CIA guys or GIAs or whatever, or GIs or, or English soldiers who invaded communist Yugoslavia, or for that matter, the Soviet Union or Czechoslovakia. The system was based on the huge mendacity, on this uh, convoluted type of a language, and it just broke apart. It just couldn't function any longer. So again, uh, when, when people ask me, there was certainly a big advantage of living in communist Yugoslavia because I could tell right away, well, I, excuse me if I make a joke, I could even tell from the distance a communist hack, you know, to, from 200 meters, I could tell him by his physical anthropology. Can I make another joke, folks, you know, talking about feminism, okay? Have you ever met a very attractive feminist lady? Okay, okay we'll talk about it some other day. Right? But it's very interesting on the psychological level because communism, we, we normally study it on the international level as a phenomenon, as a political phenomenon. But there is also, there are a couple of books written on the psychology of communism as well. Why do people flock to this communistic belief? Why, for instance, intellectuals, particularly the media people, they don't call themselves now co communists, they call themselves multiculturalists, they call themselves very tolerant people. They're always the vanguard. Of course, they've replaced, look at this, they've replaced the iconography. They've replaced the imagery. Once upon a time, it was the husky proletarian, you know, the proletarian, the big working blue-collar guy, who was their symbol. Now, he has betrayed him. Blue-collar worker is no longer in, 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 in cool. He's no, no, no longer in town. Who has replaced this blue, the blue-collar worker? The homosexual, okay? The transgender, <laughs> the, the lesbians, okay? Whatever you want to call them. Diesel dykes, that's, that's how they call them in, in the States, you know. So it's very interesting to look the, at the iconography of your journalists here in the mainstream press, as well as in, in, the, in, the, in the United States of America, how those people have evolved from being a very vocal disciples of uh, strong, muscled proletariats and uh, seeking and looking for the glorious future, advocating this glorious future, permanent economic progress, and all of a sudden they've completely abandoned, they've trashed their workers, you know, they, they, they're no longer, in fact, even the National, uh, the Front National in France, most of their voters, you know, what, what, who makes the, the, the bulk of their electorate in, in France? The workers. Workers vote for, for, for Marine Le Pen. You know? So that's a very interesting historical phenomenon that we are now observing. <laughs> now, here we come to, finally to the liberal West. You know, my argument is also <clears throat> that communism fell apart in the East because many of its uh, ideological principles have been fully implemented in practice in the West. Not with the title of communism, but let's say affirmative action, let's say this diversity thing that you have in academia, let's say this massive immigration. All of those principles could not realize, could not materialize in the Soviet Union in ex-communist Yugoslavia for obvious reasons. Those were very Spartan, very frugal societies, and they certainly, Moscow back in the 60s and 70s, or Prague or Belgrade, could not serve as a beacon, as a light for would-be immigrants from Somalia or from uh, Jamaica or from Turkey, because those were, you know, poor countries. You know? So people, you know, just they struggled, you know, to make ends meet. So those guys, you know, those would-be immigrants and those real immigrants, they were, they were not stupid. They were pretty much smart. They knew that they could get health benefits in a capitalist West, you know, like in Bonn or in Berlin or Cologne, let alone here in, in the UK. That's the reason why in the 60s and 70s and 80s and even nowadays you had these floods of uh, immigrants coming to the West instead of... Uh, what was once communist East. So ironically, precisely, that's, that's the irony of history. And that's why I keep telling you we should never give up, you know, don't be too pessimistic. History is always open. Who could have predicted that it was thanks to communism, I repeat it, thanks to communism, that Eastern Europe nowadays from, 
let's say from Riga all the, the way down to Trieste, of let's say from the Baltic, uh, Baltics to the Balkans, and then from uh, o the Oder River, from uh, East Germany, from Görlitz, let's say approximately from Dresden all the way to Novosibirsk, is all white. You know, so it was thanks to communism. You know, I think, uh, and the quotation marks, of course. Again, I repeat, those people, those would-be immigrants from Africa or, or sub-Indian uh, sub continent simply knew very well that despite this fancy talk about brotherhood and unity and diversity, that our party hacks, our party communist leaders back in the 60s and 70s were regurgitating on all wavelengths from Poland all the way down to Yugoslavia were simply, simply untrue. That just didn't function. So those communistic principles, so let's call them paleo-communistic principles, were far better entrenched in the West. And that's the reason why this idea, this utopia achieved, this utopia of, of the multicultural, multiracial, classless society is far more now threatening and far more, it's better entrenched here in the UK or for that matter in Germany, let alone the United States, than in the East. And even nowadays, if you talk to young East Europeans, be they the Polish guys or Croats or Bulgarians, what have you, you will find that those people are far more racially aware, uh, more nationally aware. Probably they sometimes cannot frame it very well. Sometimes they still have in this illusion about this glorious West, you know, about big bucks, you know, how to make quick a buck and how to live well and listen to rock music, what have you. But those folks, um, yes, they almost, uh, how can I say it, uh, it's ingrained in them that they have to be proud of their roots, okay, so they don't have any, many hang-ups about being called, you know, racist or being called uh, uh, whatever, Nazis. Sometimes this is a badge of honor for many Croats, you know, for many Poles, to, to say the least. Again, as far as the West is concerned, and we'll, we'll, we'll stay with this topic for a while, we have those fancy words, and I was telling you yesterday, those, most of those words and most of those constructs, most of those compound nouns actually emerged on American campuses back in the 70s and early, uh, early 80s. Like you have ethnic sensitivity training, which is basically the Xerox copy of the same stuff, the same verbal construct we had in communist Yugoslavia. Ethnic sensitivity training means literally that on campuses, professors get together of different races and then they have to get in this pep talk, you know, talking to each other, you know, how, how beautiful the diversity is, how they have to diversify their campus with more, with more foreigners, with more Asians, with more Martians or whatever, you know, with people from different parts of the world, you know. Then uh, again, you have diversity, and then, of course, then you have the Holocaust studies and neo-Nazi and all this stuff, and we'll talk about this some other day. Okay, this, uh, let, let me just focus a little bit on the hate speech. Hate speech, I don't know how many of you trace the origin of this construct, okay? This is a relatively new construct, hate speech. It actually emerged on American campuses before it spilled over in the legislation. It's not on the federal legislation, but some states do have a hate speech in the United States of America. I'm not talking now about Yugoslavia. I'm talking about um, the United States of America. So hate speech is a construct, a verbal construct, that is now commonly used all around the world, uh, all around the West, the glorious West. The French also translated it, and the German also, but they don't use it as much as the English-speaking uh, audience, as the English-speaking, uh, uh, as the English ang Anglophone uh, media. Hate speech, look, it's an oxymoron. Somebody asked, let's say, a layman's question. Let's say you studied political science 101 in the first class. Well, I would ask my professor, professor, could you please explain me what you mean by hate speech? What's the difference between hate speech and, 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 and free speech, you know? Like, what is free speech for a Palestinian guy, let's say, from the Gaza Strip? Is a hate speech from a guy across the, across the you know, from, from a Jewish uh, colonist over there, okay? What may be a free speech uh, for a Serb, you know, a Serbian guy, a Serbian national in, in Serbia, may be a hate speech for an Albanian guy next door. So this is a very, very tricky, actually it's a, it's a legal trap, it's, it's a linguistic trap, okay? Hate speech is meaningless. Well, somebody can say that I'm now indulging and wallowing in my hate speech, but basically I'm just using my privilege of free speech. And I want to examine certain things, both as a scholar, as a writer, and not necessarily as a scholar, as a writer, just as a normal person. I have questions crossing my mind. You have to be dubious. You have to have. A, you constantly have to question things that are around us. Even what I'm talking to, I'm not expecting you to take it and to swallow it for granted. Here, okay? Just ask yourself, what is this guy talking about? So start always with the language. Hate speech is a misnomer. It's it's an ugly misnomer. 
And I have nothing against it, I must repeat it, as long as we stay within the realm of linguistics, so as long as we stay within the realm of communication. But the problem becomes when? When it spills over into our legislation. Then it can get very, very dangerous. And I will address this issue shortly now. It's okay when we use those crack, we crack jokes and fine, and once upon a time we all crack jokes, you know, there are millions of jokes that the Croats have uh, for the Muslims and for Serbs and vice versa, of course, you know, and it seems to, to me that we, we can crack jokes against each other. You can always crack jokes against whites, but if you crack a joke against a non-white, you may, again, even here in the UK, you may have some legal problems. Now, again, the liberal system allows us so-called freedom, it can... You know, that's one thing I, which I find, ut, you know, really utterly you know, uh, uh, despicable and, 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 and hypocritical. On the one hand, our media and our, and our politicians, uh, I'm sure Mr. Griffin knows them better than I do, they talk about the human rights or how the rights, or how the human rights were violated by uh, of a guy who, in, who lives in Tibet or in East Timor, or for that matter, uh, a guy in Senegal or in Mali. But what about my rights, you know? What about our rights? I mean, am I, what about the rights and I'm, I'm literally hundreds of people who are now in jail in, 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 in Germany who did not commit any violent crime, but they just committed a crime, a uh, thought crime. They said certain things which are not allowed by the criminal code Oh, again, according to the uh, criminal code in, in, in Germany and in Austria. So again, I, I think it's a little bit foolish to talk about human rights. Uh, uh, you know, you, you read, uh, of course, Dickens' uh, Bleak House. You know Miss Jellyby, you know Miss Jellyby from Bleak House. She had five or six kids. They live in squalor, you know, very dirty. They never wash everything. And yet this lady hallucinates all the time about human rights of some distant tribe in Africa. Now, this is a typical leftist mindset, okay? They like to project themselves into antipodes. They like talking about the Maoris or Samoans, how they need to have rights on the indigenous in, in Australia, where I was recently, or for that matter, the Indians in, 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 uh, in um, in um, Lahore or, or whatever, and I certainly I respect that. But what about the rights of all people here? What about my elementary rights as a, uh, to say things and to examine certain issues, particularly of historical nature, particularly uh, of uh, issues dealing with modern historiography, which is a very dangerous minefield, which I'm certainly not going to tackle here. You know, the body counts of different tribes, of different victimhoods, this is a highly explosive issue. So and I, know, I know professors, even some top-notch professors who for a variety of reasons have to read and proofread their texts 10 or 20 times in the row before they submit the text because they want to make sure that some of the portions of that text is not being extrapolated and used against them in the court. It happens. Literally, I'm talking about hundreds of people now who are in, in jail in uh, serving, uh, who have breached this, what they call it, uh, uh, 130 uh, paragraph for the German criminal code. <coughs> so yes, indeed, our liberal system allows us freedom. We can do whatever we want. We can strip ourselves naked. We can run down the mall, and we'll probably hit the headlines. We'll probably make, make us star ourselves. We can, you can do everything, everything. However, a couple of things you're never ever supposed to do in our so-called free society. You are not supposed to touch the liberal founding myths. And this is, of course, the issue of race and the issue of contemporary historiography. I'm not going to go into details, but it's very funny. It's very interesting, okay? And just ask yourself, put yourself in the shoes of a professor now at some prominent university here, history, history professor at some university here in the UK. I'm sure I spoke with some of them. In private, they did tell me, look, Tom, well, our hands are tight. I, I don't want to lose my tenure. I don't want to do this and that. So I guess I, I, I don't want to, folks, make my own uh, judgments here. I can just make another digression. Please do excuse me if I digress too much. When I was a professor at Cal State Fullerton, which is a quite a prominent university down in, the, in California, I was in 1990. I was a good professor. I had really best top-notch uh, student evaluations. You can guess I had about 25, 30 percent of, of uh, American residents of non-European origin. And I hate to say that. That was probably the main reason why I quit after four years. In order to avoid having a hassle with some of my minority students, you know, even legal hassles, 
I gave them passing grades. I gave them Bs and I gave them, well, sometimes B minuses, simply because I didn't want to be going to those ethnic sensitivity training committees and what have you, or being accused of, of, of uh, giving him a bad, grade, a bad grade on the basis of his race. Of course, you can imagine how it affected my European-American students who could conceptualize. I was teaching a course, uh, Introduction to Political Science, and I was teaching also a course in political philosophy. And then in 91, just before Yugoslavia collapsed, I was teaching a course in, in East European politics. It was very well attended. But as I said, some, many, many of my uh, uh, black students, or for that matter, black American students, non-European students, could not follow this, not just in terms of regurgitating the material, the raw material, but just in conceptualizing, you know, what is this communism about? How do, how do we fit Eastern Europe into communism? What does this mean in terms of uh, two competing ideologies? They had much, they had a hard time following this course. It was an undergraduate course, not a graduate course, whereby my white students, my white American students, they, they started yawning. You know, they wanted to make it a little bit faster. And of course, I, I, I myself, I, again, this is my main thesis of my, of my speech today. The problem, of course, you can say is Buckingham Palace or Champs-Élysées in France, or you can say it's Strasbourg, where, where Mr. Nick Griffin is sitting, or, or for that matter, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, this in Brussels. This is a big problem. But the real, real issue is the academia and the, and the higher education. This is where the big brainwashing system begins. And this is where, this is a very closed circuit type of a environment. I live there with my colleagues, with my mostly leftist colleagues. Most of them agree with me, but they wanted to protect their tenure, their turf. They didn't want to rock the boat. I guess, I guess you don't probably know me enough. You can read some of my pieces and my stuff. You can, you can, you can judge my own character, why I quit, why I left, because I just simply couldn't tolerate this massive lie. All the more so because I went through one lie back in communist Yugoslavia, which was physically bad. It left traces of blood, of course. It was physically repressive. But at least it was visible, it was, which was really striking your eyes, whereby this repression, this, uh, this cozy intellectual repression, I call it soft totalitarianism, if you wish, it's far, far more dangerous because it gets into you, you don't know who your friend is or who your foe is, and look, I know it, guys, you're, you're, you're under peer pressure, you know, you're under peer pressure, oh, are you hanging around with those Nazis, with those skinheads, uh, look at them, you know, how you guys do that, look, they're all tattooed, they're all stupid, like they're all criminals, they kill people, you know, they skin them alive, you know, these are Nazis, they put them in gas chambers, you know, they will do something to you, Be watch out, you know, this is the type of a lingo you hear from the peers. And I understand it perfectly. I have a son who is 22 now. Of course, Yugoslavia, Croatia is somewhat different. And you can still say certain things you cannot even say here in the UK. <clears throat> because we went through the war and it's very anti-communist. The church in Croatia is extremely anti-communist, very anti-liberal. And they're very much against his transgender studies, you know, unlike other uh, our Catholic churches in other parts of Europe. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and on for hours, but I don't want to put you to sleep, so please tell me. I'll shut up, you know, immediately. I'll just uh, allow me a few more examples and then possibly. <clears throat> Again, when, be always careful. When countries talk about themselves as being the best of all the countries on earth, when they start, you know, bragging and posturing with a degree of democracy, you have to be careful. All right? Because usually the terror, the repression is the worst when you are the least cognizant of it. Okay? So you have to make an extra intellectual effort to make sure what exactly is this new repression all about. You know? I can keep myself, strip myself naked, I can do crazy things, I can smoke dope, I can do whatever I want, but if I don't have my rights to, to uh, express uh, some critical ideas, or at least challenge the system with some critical ideas, not necessarily disputing those ideas, but just asking some critical academic questions, then I certainly have questions uh, about the veracity, or how can I say, the lo uh, longevity of the system. We saw it how actually communism collapsed. And I'll tell you, I don't know if this is good news, I'm not sure that this system will last much longer either. A year or two, I don't want to make some crazy speculations. There's some, there's now some patching up going on in the European Union. But it seems to me that the system now, the entire uh, Western system, including the United States of America, is uh, now poised on this downhill, uh, on this downhill uh, tour. So we'll see what happens next. 
Now, again, Germany is the country which often brags about its democracy and so on. Again, an, another, another digression. My dad, that I mentioned, was a Catholic lawyer. He was in prison uh, four years, my sister too, in communist Yugoslavia, just for simple things, you know. He was a very modest man, good man, an old man. And he was adopted by 14 congressmen also in the United States of America. One thing he taught me when I was still a boy, you know, then, you know, when I was a boy, I was just like you. I grew up with Grateful Dead, you know. You know Grateful Dead, you know? You know, it was a rock me musicians, whatever, and so I listened to those stuff. So I didn't care very much. I had long hair, earrings, you know, all this crap, you know. But so I didn't, I didn't worry very much about books. But I had sharp eyes, and I was also questioning the system. And my dad, you know, told me, and I still remember that, son, any place you go to, any place, any country you travel to, don't read the constitution of the country. Read the criminal code or the penal code because this will give you a clear-cut idea of what this country is all about. Why is that? Because there is always a divergence, a cleavage between the Constitution. Those of you who are in the who study the Constitution know, know, know what I mean. It's full of praise, it's full of eulogies, you know, how beautiful it is. You, you know, look at the best possible Constitution, you probably never had a chance to look at it. Stalin, in 39, in 30, 36, 36, the Soviet Union came up with the first Constitution, the most democratic Constitution on earth in 36. But a person who is critical, who has some second questions and second thoughts about the whole system, needed to read the criminal code, which was very bad, very scary, okay? So, again, when you go to Germany, when you go to the States, read the criminal code, when you go to France as well. Here we go. <clears throat> Article 5, real quite quick, of the German Constitution, what they call a basic law. By the way, the German Constitution was not crafted, was not drafted by the Germans. It was a very special case. It was basically <coughs> drafted by the, by the American uh, scholars and um, different types of people, or whatever. So uh, it's, still, it's still there, and it's very open, and it says Article 5 that people have enjoyed complete freedom of speech and what have you. And keep in mind, as soon as you look at the criminal code, what they call the, uh, uh, yes, the criminal code, Article 130 of the German Criminal Code, they have this paragraph called Volksverhetzung. Oh, the German language is so difficult to translate. Actually, it's a, such a, it's, a, it's a compound word. It's a typically totalitarian compound word. I'll explain it later. Which means literally for Volksverhetzung, it's like agitation of the people or, or, or bullying the people. Uh, it's a very bizarre neologism, and it's a very difficult to translate it into English. Now, under this Volksverhetzung, under this, uh, what I call it, agitation of the people uh, paragraph, you can get arrested just for, if you crack a joke against, let's say, some non-Europeans, or for that matter, if you start digging or, or, or dipping a little bit into modern historiography and making some... Uh, queries about uh, what really was going on during the Second War and after the Second War, so then you could get into some troubles with, with, with this specific uh, uh, 130, Article 130. Now, one thing you need to know that uh, the German language is a very inflected language, okay? Now, it's very rich language. I love it, okay? Because you have suffixes and prefixes. You can literally, if you know a little bit of the German language, you can expand it into infinity with so many suffixes and prefixes. This is not possible with the French language and the English language. Why? Because these two languages are more context contextual languages, okay? You cannot, uh, like for instance, the, German, the Germans have the word Arbeiten, which means to work. But then if you add uh, prefixes, zu or durch, zu arbeiten, durch arbeiten, verarbeiten, it means completely, it, it changes completely the, the, the meaning of the word. It's a very highly, uh, <coughs> it's a very rich language, but at the same time, it lends itself to linguistic and political manipulations. And on the basis of that, people end up in jail, you know. But it's not the matter, you know, how you, uh, how you, you, if you are, if you are fine or not in German. <coughs> It's just a matter of who is going to be your, your attorney or your lawyer and how, how well is this is going to defend you, okay? Because uh, things can be easily extrapolated. So some guy can say, no, what Tom Sonico, for that matter, what the journalist meant uh, by this is not exactly this, but he actually was attempting to, to besmirch or, or, or belittle the, the, the Tamils or the Kurds or, for that matter, the, the Jordanians who live in uh, Kreuzberg near Berlin. So, again, be careful. Now, again, subsection 3, real fast, 
of this uh, same law, of the same penal code, it's more explicit. And you've got to be also careful with that. I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's my translation. Whoever publicly or in a meeting approves or denies or renders harmless an, art, uh, an act committed under the rule of National Socialism shall be punished with imprisonment for no more than five years of fine. Sounds good. But look at this abstract sentence. Okay, I should probably read it in German to you. Re denies or renders harmless an act committed to, under the rule of national social. What does that mean? You know, you can talk about the sufferings of the German ex-police, like I did two weeks ago. It was a huge gathering at Klagenfurt. I was talking about the German ex-police from, you know, 15 million of them were thrown out of Eastern, Ger in Eastern Europe in 45, 46. If somebody could easily just extrapolate this and say, well, well, Tom Sunik, by focusing on the victimhood of those poor civilians, people, German people fleeing from Eastern Germany because the Soviets were coming with tanks, you know, the rapists, you know, you can imagine the hell. In 46, 40, uh, 45 was a real hell going on in Central and Eastern Europe, you know. And then, uh, of course, somebody can always uh, tinker and temper with this sentence and uh, tell you, well, he didn't mean that, he, he meant something else. Again, on top of it, the Germans also have what they call the Verfassungsschutz. So this is the, quote-unquote, the agency for the protection of the Constitution. But this is basically a spying agency. There are 16 of them plus the federal ones, so 17 of them. And their prime goal is to, quote-unquote, observe the unconstitutional, whatever that means, behavior of different groups, including not just the right-wingers, but also the uh, different Islamic groups and so on and so forth. I don't want to bother any further, just the last thing, the things are not much better in France. In France in 1990, a law was passed, 1990, it was quite recently, on the initiative of a socialist deputy, whatever his name, Laurent, Laurent Fabius, Fabius, and the other guy, a communist deputy, uh, Claude Guesseau. So this is called, called popularly uh, Claude uh, Fabius Guesseau law. It's a very strict law. It prevents many historians uh, from doing a solid research as far as the post-war and uh, war uh, Vichy France was concerned. There was even a couple of years ago, again, just for your information, there was a petition even by leftist scholars, not just right-wing scholars, leftist scholars, to abolish, to, to actually abrogate this law. But it's still there. And again, again, uh, folks, uh, as far as your civil courage is concerned and civil uh, responsibility, you know how this law was passed. Just me, let me give you a detail. It was uh, in 1990, this law was passed, very strict law against revisionism, against racism, what have you. And uh, uh, on the... Uh, was on the initiative of the socialist deputy and a, a communist deputy. It was passed on the 13th of July, one day before their national holiday in France, 13th of the July, 1990. You know, half of the national parliament deputies, you know, half of the people, the politicians, they went out to Côte d'Azur, you know, they went to have fun. So only half of the parliamentarians were sitting in the parliament. So the law was uh, adopted, uh, this, uh, this bill was, was, was adopted because there were, not enough, there were not enough conservative votes to, to oppose this bill. So again, this tells you again, when push comes to shove, to show a little bit of civil courage, you don't have to get involved with some high politics and with those controversial issues, but you've got to be present, you've got to be physically there, because many conservative uh, politicians regretted the passage of this law afterwards, but it was way too late. The 14th of July, it was hot, people were out in the summertime having fun and what have. Okay, so let me now come to my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. I will not keep you long, and I hope that there might be some interesting questions. Now, uh, the sensorial intellectual climate in the Western media, media is very similar to the Soviet-style uh, propaganda, except that it's far more, it's better covered, it's better wrapped up, it's more insidious, it's more... Uh, so, it's soft, it doesn't leave the traces of blood, but it does kill your soul, okay, which is even worse. And it doesn't really create the opposition as the Soviet propaganda, propaganda Soviet lingo did back in, in uh, during the Cold War. But this again tells you that this increasing uh, uh, repression in, uh, in the West, including the European Union, Again, let me digress a little bit. Please do have a look at some of those documents from the European Union. 
Folks, for the first thing that will cross your mind is, am I stupid? How do I decipher this lingo? What does that mean? This is precisely meant to make you look stupid. Because those guys don't want you, they, 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 they don't know what simplicity means, what clear-cut English means. They, they wrap this up, this prose, in such a difficult, you know, Soviet-style lingo that you are not supposed to understand what that means. Except that they all get very well paid, you know, all those people who work in Brussels and so on. And it just tremendously reminds me the EU uh, official documents I had, because I worked there as a diplomat, so I know firsthand. I, 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 it reminds me very much of the communist linguistics and the communist syntax and prose back in the 60s and 70s in communist Yugoslavia. Now, this again, ladies and gentlemen, tells us that the system, by resorting to such uh, first uh, verbal, uh, verbal uh, traps and then legal uh, entrapments, is incre increasingly getting worried. So again, as I said yesterday, do not overestimate the system. It's very worried. Uh, the multicultural uh, utopia doesn't really function the way it was supposed to. And uh, there are serious tensions. There are serious, you know, even racial uh, tensions. And uh, I don't know what you know about France. In good, in uh, Dijon, there were a couple of months ago. Then there were in Lyon. There are certain suburbs you don't want to even visit. And, of course, the, the, the very fact that the European Union, for that matter, the United Kingdom, or for that matter, the United States, are resorting to those, quote-unquote, anti-hate anti speech laws, proves that those countries have something to hide. Why do they have to hide something? Let me say one thing quite clearly here. We have to abide by the law. I tell my people in, in the United States and France, folks, regardless of what I think about the American legislation, I have to respect it. Um, you must respect But there are ways how you can circumvent it and how you can write to your local representatives and tell them, look, this is a fraud. This doesn't make sense. This hurts our ancestry. This hurts white people here. This hurts our heritage. We want to hear more about our ancestry. We don't want to just get involved in those abstracts and abstract acrobatics about diversity. This is how you've got to confront your, your local leaders here. <clears throat> now, let me tell you one last thing, and I, I will be done with that. And now, it's, it's a matter, ladies and gentlemen, of the spirit of the time. You know, most folks are just, what to say, nod men. You can say I, I met them, quite a few of them in the States, in academia. I met as a diplomat back in communist Croatia, and in, in communist, in, in what was a free Croatia, what was supposed to be a free Croatia. You know, just people go with the stream, with the flaw. Now it's very popular, especially for younger people, to, you know, under peer pressure, you've got to listen to rap music, you've got to dress up in a certain fashion, and so on and so forth. But rest assured, when tides change, you know, when different times occur, the very same people now who blame you, who, who actually call you names, they'll be the first one to flock to you, to you and tell you, no, I'm so sorry, we knew it all along, but we just couldn't do it for obvious reasons. We had family, we had our perks, and so on and so forth. So... This will again be the case, ladies and gentlemen, with modern liberal elites that we are observing on the daily basis, be it here or in Tucson or where I was in Atlanta, where I was recently, <coughs> who will not hesitate to turn into rabbi racist and conservatives or anti-Semites anti as soon as new self-evident truths appear tomorrow on the horizon. Thank you for your attention.